something that is broken in their lives. We do. We do. We have, there's something that's broken. There's something that's just not right, that maybe just won't be, that's just not perfect in life. The most hopeless people in the world are people who recognize that they have a problem, but they have no vision from God about how to solve that problem. That's the most hopeless people in the world. Everybody has problems. The key is, do you have a vision to see that problem mended? Churches have problems. I'm not speaking anything into this church. I mean, this, this church has problems, but every church in the world has problems. You know why? Because it's made up of people who run it like you and I. <laughs> it's made up of people who have problems. Everybody has problems. And so therefore, if we have problems as people, the church is gonna have problems at times. It doesn't mean that the church doesn't need to carry on. It just means that we are so much ever so much more dependent upon God to lead us through. We've got to be dependent upon God. God is the only one that can bring us through the situations that we have. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. I've mentioned this several times before, but this is, the, this is one, of the, one of our base scriptures here. When we're talking about vision, it's hard to go wrong with this. Where there is no vision, the people perish. If you have no vision for anything in your life, you're going to fail. You're going to perish. It's not going to last. You must have a vision. Churches must have a vision. It didn't just come from the pastor. The pastor leads the church through the vision. But we've got to grab a hold of a vision as well. But all the visions that we have together at, at, over our different ministries and different things that we're doing and what we see and hope for in, in the church has all got to coincide and work together with the overall vision of the church. Next week, I'm going to be sharing with you exactly what we're going to be doing, what God has called the church to do. Oh, pastor, it's going to be one of them generic things, general things. Yeah, it's, there's going to be a lot general, okay? There is. It's going to be the purpose, the purpose of our church. How we fulfill that purpose is going to be one bite at a time. We've got a huge elephant to eat. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And then the more people you have eating on that elephant, the faster that elephant goes away. You understand what I'm saying? So as we begin to grow and people grab a hold of that vision of what we're doing and what we're seeing, and new people are coming into the kingdom of God, the more people are going to be eating on that, on that elephant. Yes, I'm talking about eating again. And here we're out in the middle of the fast. <laughs> Everybody ends up somewhere in life. A few people end up somewhere on purpose. And those are the ones with a vision. And the most practical advantage of vision is that it sets direction for our lives. It serves as a road map of where you're going. So we've got to have a vision. Vision provides the push through the problems. You see, the enemy likes to provide problems. The enemy likes to set up obstacles and roadblocks in front of churches. And I'm specifically talking about the overall church. He loves to set up problems and roadblocks. And you know what? A lot of times, they'll stop a church. A church without a vision, a church with a vision will push through them. A, push, a, a church with a vision will work through the obstacles, will work through the challenges. They won't turn and run, drop out of church. Let me tell you something. Guys, I know a lot of people come and go in churches. They do. They'll, they'll get their feelings hurt and they'll leave for whatever reason or, or, or whatever the reason is. You can run to another church because the grass is greener over there. And you've heard me say this before. But I'll tell you this. There's been a lot of cow patties drop on that field to make that grass greener that's greener on the other side of that fence. 
you don't realize the cow patties that have been dropped. There's problems in every church. There's obstacles in every church. Kind of like marriages, too. Oh, people get divorced and they, they jump over to this other person because it's the person of their dreams and they're going to live happily ever after <laughs> until the honeymoon's over. <laughs> you're going to realize that you've still got problems that you're going to have to work through. It doesn't, it doesn't end with somebody else new. There's always problems to work through. The key is you've got to work through them, and you, you, you can't do it by yourself. You've got to have God. And that's exactly where we are in the church, is we can't do these things by ourselves. We've got to have God. God's got to be the center of everything that we do. He's got to be the reason of why we do things. He does. He's got to be the reason. If we do it for anything else other than, the, other than for the kingdom purpose of, of, of God, then the next time something goes wrong, well, bye, George. I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? When we do things for fame, when we do things for a pat on the back, and it's good to receive recognition. Don't get me wrong. It's good to... It's good to that those are good things and they, they need to happen. But you know what if it doesn't? If you're doing it for that, then that means when the next time you don't receive what you are thinking you're going to receive, then you're going to quit. My wife told me, and there's been times in our marriage, I, she didn't know for sure if, if, if I was going to make it. You think our marriage is, is wonderful and we've still got problems just like everybody else that we have to work through. There's been times in our, in our in a, in, and she, she made this statement to me. She said, you know what, my, my salvation is not based off of you. If you run and, and go away from God, she said, I'm going to remain strong. And I'm saying that. I'm kind of be transparent with you here. But it's, it's the truth. We shouldn't go to church because our mama told us to. We shouldn't serve God because we think that's the thing to do. We, we, we need to have a, everyone needs to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You shouldn't teach a Sunday school class just because there's nobody else going to do it and, and you feel sorry for it. You know what? Do it because you're making a difference in the kingdom of God. People are going to fail you. Your pastor is going to fail you at times. You know something? I'm not going to be at every hospital visit. I may miss it. Sometimes people don't let me know. Sometimes, sometimes I'm so bombarded, I'm not there. Or whatever the situation is. I may disappoint you somewhere down the line. But don't base your church attendance and don't base your... your uh, um, um, uh, your relationship with God... Over a pastor. Nor the church. You've got to have deeper roots than that. Because the next time someone that you look up to fails you, you're going to turn and run. Some people go to a church because of a pastor. Some people go because of um, certain things for their kids, whatever the reason is of why they go. Man, don't, don't base your, your relationship with God, especially on superficial things that, that when, when you get disappointed by those things, it's going to cause you to turn away from God. My wife's not saved because I'm a preacher. You shouldn't be saved in a relationship with, uh, or, or, well, you, you, it, it needs to be more than just superficial things.
We've got to have a vision. Vision provides the push through our problems. It, vision provides the energy for our efforts. If you can't see, if you're going Sunday to Sunday operating your ministry of whatever you're doing, or if you're just coming to church Sunday to Sunday and you, you, you have no expectations of what the future is going to be, you're just living week to week, I'm telling you, you're going to burn out and you're going to, it, it, you're going to spiritually die before too long. Pray that God will give you a vision. If you're teaching a Sunday school class, get a vision from God. Have a goal. Have a vision of where you're going to go. You know, and, and I can't give that to you. I can't. I wish, you know, that, that would be great if I could just, boom, all right, there, there you go, right there, there. Here's your vision. No, you, that comes from God. That comes from you seeking God. My vision for this church, if I don't have a vision and I'm just going week to week, just preaching Sunday to Sunday, no aim for where to go, I, we're, we're, we're just going to, it's going to be like a long walk. It's going to be like driving down Interstate 40 between Little Rock and Memphis. Boring, straight, Nothing on either side of the road. Even the towns you come to, there's nothing to go to. It is the longest, most boring drive, I think, in the state of Arkansas. At least Highway 7, it keeps you on your toes, you know. <laughs> you got to stay awake on Highway 7. Without vision, our passion leaks. Our, our agendas surface. You get this? Without a vision, without a God vision for this church, then our own personal agendas will rise. And that's trouble. That's trouble right there. When personal, when personal agendas arise inside the church, that means there's, there, there'll be conflict. It's got to be, we've got to be on the same page. You know what, this is a, this is a, a, a fairly large congregation right here. And if everybody had their own vision of how they thought the church ought to be run and the vision for their church, can you imagine what type of tug-of-war rope that would be? You know what? We wouldn't go anywhere. If we had, say there's 200 people in here. If we had a rope with 200 all tied together right in the middle and it looked like a starburst, just a... Just a burst of all these rays going. And we all tried to pull each other in our own direction. Do you realize that we would go absolutely nowhere? That's why there needs to be one vision as a church. And even though we have our different visions inside of, inside of our different ministries and our goals, they all support the main vision of the church and we're moving forward. Amen. Amen. See, we don't need personal agendas. Uh, and also, without vision, production falls. People scatter without vision. They perish. In the Old Testament, there's a journal of a man in Nehemiah. It's really kind of a journal. And he's, he stands tall as a person with a vision who rebuilt what was broken. His name is Nehemiah. That name means the Lord's comfort. Nehemiah's visionary efforts brought comfort to God's people in the time of their greatest need. Nehemiah's lessons, they're so relevant. I'm telling you, you can read the book of Nehemiah. You can study through Nehemiah and you'll see, you'll see this. You'll see how to pray about your problems. You'll see how to, how to plan your work and work your plan. You'll see how to set God-given goals in Nehemiah. You'll also see how to motivate others when the morale is low. How many of you have ever been there? The morale was low. You didn't feel like doing anything. What's the use? What's the purpose? You'll see, how to, you, you'll see how to become a person of vision in Nehemiah. So in Nehemiah chapter 1, 
Nehemiah's hope-filled visionary leadership is a powerful example, and I don't care what type of leadership position that you're in in life, whether you're a coach or a supervisor or just a regular common everyday worker at whatever store you're at, or a parent, a student leader, executive, uh, uh, and, and spiritual leaders, you can all learn from Nehemiah. So if you want to learn how to get a vision for the, for the things of God, get inside of Nehemiah and read it. So let's start by studying understanding just a little bit of, of where and when and how this guy lived. So the setting is this, 500 years before the time of Christ. This is Nehemiah. God's people had lived in Israel for centuries before, and God told them, obey me, and you'll live in the land for a long time. Disobey me, and you'll be carried off into captivity. And that's exactly what happened. That's what happened. They were carried off into captivity. The Babylonians came and conquered God's people, and they, and, and, and they, they took all the citizens a, a thousand miles away. Why? Because they were disobedient to God. Let me tell you something. Inside the Word of God, God gives a set of instructions for us on how to live. And if we don't follow those instructions, we're living out of disobedience, especially if we signed up <laughs> through salvation to live by that by, by that by those set of rules now but I explained this in our Sunday school class this morning don't look at the Word of God as a set of do's and don'ts and that God is just sitting there with his thumb on top of you you know you can't do this you can't do this you can't do that it's not because God doesn't like you or God's trying to keep you away from something fun it's because he loves you it's because he knows how we are. Amen. It's because he knows what we enjoy doing and what we'll get wrapped up in. He sees the future. And I gave this example of a, of a little kid, your, your baby that's in the, in, in the house and you, you have a hot burner going on your, on your stove and, and the baby reaches up to touch it and, and, and you go up to that baby and, and you just out of, out, of a, out of desperation, you slap that baby's hand away and say, no, don't touch that hot stove. You knock that baby out of the way. That's me. That's horrible. <laughs> no. It's because that mama loves that baby and does not want to see that baby hurt. Doesn't want to see him burnt. He, the, the mama is older and wiser and sees down the road of what's going to happen to that baby because the baby is innocent and does not know much. That's the same way our God is. In these do's and don'ts inside the Word of God, he's not trying to keep you away from fun. He's not trying to be just this mean tyrant of a God, a dictator, and just cruel and mean. And He's trying to protect you because he loves you. He sees where you're heading. He sees that there's danger. He sees that if, you get you, if, if, if we as people get involved in such things, we will be destroyed. Amen. So see, we don't have a mean... God, God's not mean as a father. He's loving. He cares for us. That's why the word of God has do's and don'ts. Amen. If you could sum the word of God up into one word, one word, if you could sum it up, love. Amen. That's it. Love. Summing that word of God up into one word, it would, it would be love because he loves us so from the beginning to the end. From the beginning to the middle <laughs> to the end. It's all about love. He has a plan for us. He has a purpose. And through his word, we will find it. Through fasting, through praying, we will find God's vision. He will provide for us our direction. Amen. Amen. So... The discipline of God had ended with Nehemiah, or with the, with the children of Israel. So, several years before Nehemiah's day, some of God's people were given permission to return to Jerusalem after being captive. They they were given permission to return to rebuild a broken down temple and a broken down city. But I want to tell you that the attempts to rebuild all those protective walls around the city failed 
They didn't come to pass. And as a result, very few people lived in the capital city. Jerusalem was a city of ruins during that time. Nehemiah lived in the royal city of Susa, serving the Persian king. Judah, the homeland of Nehemiah, was a thousand miles away. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. That was his position. You know what a cupbearer is? A cupbearer is more than a butler, okay? A cupbearer held a position, it was, it was a, a position of great responsibility. At each meal, he would test the king's food and cup to make sure that it wasn't poisoning. Cupbearer, it was important. Man, so if, if it was poisoned, the cupbearer would die and the king would know not to eat it or, or to drink it. It didn't really sound like a great job to me, but, but, but think of this for a second. This man who stood close to the king in public, he had to be handsome, cultured. He had to be very knowledgeable. And he had to be able, he was, he was also advised the king when he was asked to advise the king. So he had to be wise also. He was an all-in-one type guy to the king. He was a sidekick. So in that sense, he was more than just a butler. And because he had access to the king, the cupbearer was a great man of influence. Because if the cupbearer could get a hold of, grab a hold of something... And he was in constant communication. He went everywhere the king went. He was very influential to the king. So the cupbearer, in a sense, was a very, very important decision or position if, if he was able to live, <laughs> if he didn't get poisoned. So really, the cupbearer was rather like a prime minister and a master of ceremonies all wrapped up into one person. So Nehemiah was the right man in the right place for God to use. He had a vision. He had a vision to see a problem. He had a vision to see its solution. And because he had vision, he had hope. So let's look at a visionary person today. We're going to be looking at Nehemiah and following this route and see exactly who Nehemiah was. So a visionary person, number one, sees the need. He sees the need. If you're a visionary person, you will see the need. Look at verses 1 through 3. Let's read this. The words of Nehemiah, the son of uh, uh, Hakaliah. Now it happened in the son of Kislev in the, 12th, in, in the 20th year when I was in Susa, the capital, that Hananiah, one of my brothers, and some of the men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and, and about Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. So the people that remained there, they were in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Bad news. Bad news came from Jerusalem. The walls are flattened. Gates were burned. The morale was low. But Nehemiah cared, cared about the glory of God and the good people of Jerusalem. And now he hears the, that the Jerusalem Jews were in desperate days. They were in ruin. And instead of a magnificent city, Jerusalem was in shambles. And where there was once had been great glory, there was nothing more than great reproach. That's all there was. God was being dishonored as long as Jer Jerusalem laid waste because that is the city of God. This was a place where those who sought him would experience the reality of God's presence in love and in mercy. It wasn't happening, so Nehemiah was concerned about it. And he was a leader. He had a vision. He sought God. God talks to people. Amen. Amen. God makes his will known with people who talk to him, people that spend time with him. Mm. And Nehemiah was that man. 
And he just so happened to be a great influential man to the king. Wow. Man, I want to tell you this. A God-ordained vision will begin as a concern. Follow me here. A God-ordained vision will begin as a concern. Something will bother you about the way things are or the way things are headed or the lack thereof, anything. A lot of times people come to the pastor and they say, Pastor, we really need to have a ministry of this and this and this. And Why don't you do that? Why don't you start that ministry of this and this? Say what? You want me to start that? Apparently God has laid that on your heart to do. Brother, sister, God's laying that on your heart. I'm going to tell you something. I'm not against any ministry at all whatsoever. But if you're waiting on me as the pastor to, to, to ground zero start every single ministry in this church, there is absolutely no way that I could do that. And it would be foolish for you to come to, to, to expect that the pastor start and, and, and head up. Every, now, I, I'm the overseer of all the ministry. I, I mean, every ministry at this church goes through me. It really does. Because I'm the pastor. I direct that. But there's no way that I can start every ministry. There's no way. I can help you. God lays that. Uh, see, it, it, the, pastor, the pastor cannot do everything inside the church. He can't. You know what my number one job here at this church is? To train and to equip. To train and to equip. If I did everything at this church, which I know you don't expect that, but if I did everything at this church, you know what, si what kind of church we'd have? we would have a very limited, closed-minded, um, shrinking church. Because there's no way that I could carry on the ministry of even what we have right now by myself. Now, can I oversee it and give direction and guidance and training? Absolutely. I can help you. I can, I can bring you along. Come here, Dave. I can bring you along, and, 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 and this, this ministry right here, and it needs to, it, you, you, it, in order to do this ministry, David, you need to do this right here. This is how this ministry works right here. I can show David how to do this ministry <laughs> right here. And then, keep, you're, 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 yeah, keep doing the ministry. Keep doing the ministry. See, pa you, ministry doesn't stop when the pastor leaves the room. So, so you, you just got to keep doing the ministry there. That's a great workout. Oh, look at those shoulders right there. Yeah. <laughs> you keep doing that ministry. I'm getting tired. Thank you, brother. <laughs> you keep doing that ministry, and see, then what I do is I go over to the next person. And I get this next person. Come here, Wes. Uh oh. Guess, oh. Get, guess what you get to do? Oh, it, it, it's, it's, it's with oh, this oh. arm. You know, oh. this, this arm goes up and down like this. Choo -choo. You know, David did, did this. We got a train going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this ministry goes like this. And say, so I, I show Wes how to do it. And, and, uh, and thank you, brother. I show Wes how to do it. And then I, uh, and then I, uh, yeah, mother, uh, Simon says, <laughs> Simon says, stop, okay. <laughs> and, and so Wes is doing this, David's doing this in their ministries, and, and then I go over to the next person. And I train and equip that person. And in the midst, we have staff members also that are over certain ministries. And you know what? They do the same thing in their ministry. Scott in the youth ministry needs to, needs to do that with his student leaders. This is how you do this right here. This is, this is what I need done. This is, this is how, what, what you do. And then he goes over to the next one. And you see... Through leadership like that, we're able to do so much more because it's not all dependent upon one person. It's spread out. And the primary responsibility of the pastor is to train and equip. That's it. 
I mean, really, I mean, that, that's the primary, I mean, that's not all the responsibility, but that's the primary responsibility is to train and equip. You know why? Because this is an army right here. This is the kingdom of God, the army of God, marching into the battlefield. We are soldiers in the army of God. Grab hold of that vision here. So a visionary person sees that need. A God-ordained vision, I'm going to say this again, will begin as a concern. You're going to be concerned about something. You're going to be concerned about, why don't we have this? God's laying, see, God's laying something on your heart. Some of you have probably already thought that. In fact, I've even had some people come up and tell me, you know, Pastor, we really need this right here. If that's you that come up and told me that, apparently God's laying something very specific on your heart that you may need to pray about overseeing that. Heading that up, being a part of a ministry like that. You know why? Because if you have that great concern, that concern creates passion in your life to see that done. Passion drives the vision. Passion drives the vision. We need passionate people. I love children's ministry. I do. And I'm passionate about it from a pastoral standpoint. But buddy, you put me on stage with those, those kids. I, I, you know. <laughs> the parents are bad enough. <laughs> oh, man. No, I'm teasing. Some people aren't cut out to do certain things. I'm not passionate about children's ministry in that way. To do that, to head that up, that's not my, that's not my call, that's not my role. But I'm passionate about preaching the word of God to you. I'm passionate about faith assembly. I love this church. And I want to see every, every aspect of this church running like, like whatever. <laughs> Seeing everything go the way that it should be. Being all that we can be for the kingdom of God. And that comes through vision. If those of you that are fasting, that are praying for vision, and you say, Pastor, I, I, you know, I feel like I've, I haven't got any further or uh, closer to a, a receiving a vision from God than the day one. Keep praying. I'm not necessarily saying in 21 days God's going God's to just, there it is right there. It may take longer than that. God may want you to continue praying after 21 days. Don't turn back to the same person that you were before. Keep doing it. Keep going further. Keep going deeper into God. So see in that vision. Something will bother you about the way things are or the way things are headed, and you're going to get passionate about it. There are, there, there's far more needs in the church than the, than the world and the world than any of us have, have the time or the energy to meet upon our own, and, and I, I, no one's required to try to relieve them all. To try to do them. You know, there's all kinds of... Phoenix First Assembly has over 270 ministries in that church. It didn't sound like a whole lot on the surface, but then when you start thinking one through a hundred, and then another hundred, and then another... Set, that's a lot of ministries. That's a lot of ministries in a church. We don't need to have ministries just to have a ministry. We need to have a ministry that's going to benefit the kingdom of God, of who we are in this church. We need to pray about our vision for God. Pray about our vision for this church, for God to give us that vision, that hunger, that desire, that passion. Amen. Vision is a reflection of what God wants to do through us to impact the world. It's not about maintaining the status quo. It's not about just, just, just coming to church and going through the motions. 
living where, where we live, we can become comfortable. Let me tell you something. Complacency is one of the worst killers of a church. We get complacent. We've got our friends. We've got our, we've got the, uh, we've got our four and no more. We're comfortable. We've got things. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't have things paid off. We will, but we don't have things paid off. But, we, but, but, but when, we're, when we're comfortable, we get very sleepy and very lazy in the things of God and, and we expect other people to do things. I'll tell you this, even walking by, I, I, I'm a different type of pastor, I guess, than, than I don't know, than maybe you're used to, I don't know, or, or whatever. But, you know, if there's something on the floor, we say, well, you know, I wish that janitor would pick that paper up. You know what? No, don't just do that. Reach down there and pick it up and put it in the trash. <laughs> Reach down there. Get a vision. Don't wait for somebody else to do those things. Pick it up and do it yourself. Grab a hold of that. Do that yourself. We're going to have to end it here. Do you see the needs that are around you? Do you see the needs that are at this church? In fact, let me just ask you this question. And you think about it. What are the needs of faith assembly? I don't care how old you are, how young you are in this, in this auditorium, married, single, whatever. What are some needs in this church right now? Think about it. Think about the needs in this church. Or any of those needs that you're thinking about, God's been dealing with you about for a long time. Think about that for a second. How passionate are you? You're, you're, sitting, you're, you're sitting there and you're thinking, you've thought for a long time, man, I wish somebody would start this ministry. Well, I wish somebody would do We really need this. I wish somebody would do this. That may be God telling you it's you. You need to start this. You need to do this. And I guarantee you, if it's a God thing that's going to fit in the overall vision of the church, I'm for it. And I'll support it. You've, I, and I've got your back on it. If it's not a personal agenda, where, it's, where, where, where the glory comes to you, but it's going to lift up God and it's going to benefit this church, I'm for it. Amen. Stand with me this morning. Didn't exactly.